before I, we talk more about like specifically what do you might what might you do in code review? So what are the goals of code review? And they're going to be different for different people depending on a few things. So one, depending on um, the stage in the research process, is this um, review of code where the analyses are definitely set. Um, you're just about ready to submit the paper, or is it post um, manuscript review, code review, or is it at early in the project? It's also going to depend on the experience of the coder and the reviewer. If the coder's got a lot of experience, you might just be helping them with a quick check, make sure it runs, clean up any little things. Um, or if the coder is very inexperienced, there might be more work to do. And if the reviewer doesn't have much experience, there are certain things they might be able to do and certain things they might not be able to do. And also the amount of time you have available. Um, so code review can be as simple as five minutes, download the script, see if it runs. If it runs, awesome. If it doesn't, let the person know and leave them to deal with it. Um, or I've spent, you know, upwards of 12 hours doing code review for a, um, a manuscript I was reviewing. And I know that's excessive, but you can you can spend a lot of time doing code review if you're doing all of the things. So let's talk about those things. In this talk, we're going to focus on pre-submission code review by colleagues. I think that's the best place to kind of start doing code review, where if you've got a project you're working on with colleagues and one person has taken charge of writing the code, helping to helping out in the project by doing code review for that person. Or if you've written the code, getting another one of your colleagues to do code review for you. Um, we won't talk specifically about code review for um, reviewers of a manuscript, although a lot of the principles are the same. Although the, um, the one barrier with manuscripts is especially if they're um, blind review, you might not be able to ask questions. So there are things, points in the code review where you can just get stuck that if you could talk to somebody and ask them a question, you could continue, but you can't ask them. So all you can do is um, write your question, stop the review. All right, so our um, first set of goals for code review is simple. Does it run? Um, this requires very little expertise and time. As long as you know how to run scripts in the language that you've been asked to review, you can check and see if it runs. But this can result in one of the most substantial improvements in code. I think about half the time that I'm asked to review a paper, a manuscript for a journal that's already being submitted um, and it has code because um, I've ascribed to the peer reviewers openness initiative and I only review papers that have open data and code. Um, but about half the time when I do that, code doesn't run on the first pass. It used um, absolute paths or some other things that we'll talk about that can stop code from being runnable. And if you get a colleague to just double check, um, if on their computer they can download the data from the OSF or GitHub or wherever you're storing the data or open the zip file that you might send to um, a journal, can they open it up, download the data, click run, and does it run? And if it doesn't, you've got to fix some things. Um, so ideally, you would get your colleague or you would, if you were doing the code review, would access it from the same place that users would. So if you're sharing um, data and code for a preprint, are you putting it on the OSF? Then you would ask the code reviewer to download it from the OSF. Just give them that link or however the reviewers would access it. Just make notes if you get errors. Um, if you have the expertise to fix the errors, sometimes they're quite simple. Um, make a note about the fix and then try again and see um, have you run into further errors? Because often once you fix errors at the beginning of a script, that can uncover later errors. The second kind of batch of um, goals, it takes a little bit more time, but not much more expertise, is checking for reproducibility. So this is whether the, um, the code gives you the same outputs as it gave the, um, the original coder. This means they need to send you the output so you can double check. So things like the analysis results as written in the manuscript um, or plots or tables or the HTML file output from a Quarto um, document or a Jupyter notebook. 
um, or an R Markdown document. So if you have those and then checking that if you run the code, does it produce all those same things with all the same numbers? I can tell you that a very recent paper I've um, reviewed for, again, for a journal, um, when I ran the code, I didn't get the same numbers as were reported in the manuscript. And that is because they did not set a seed. Um, and some of their um, analyses use bootstrap techniques that use randomization. And so if the randomization happens differently on two computers, you can get slightly different numbers um, in the results. They weren't big changes, but they were definite changes and made me think. Um, so setting a seed makes sure that two different computers will get the same reproducible random numbers. Um, so the coder can make this whole thing easier for the reviewer by making it really clear um, what are the analysis results and the plots and the tables in their code um, and in the manuscript or any other um, like materials that they might send you. You can also let the um, coder know if you're doing this kind of check, how straightforward is it to do the check? So if you're doing this as pre-submission, how much effort did you need to go through to match every number in the manuscript to a value in the, in the code? Did their code output 10,000 lines of output that you had to search through manually for each number and was not well organized? Or did it have subheadings and very clear, like this creates figure two, this one creates table three, um, so that you could go match back and forth between the outputs and the code. All right, now requiring a bit more expertise and time is checking if the code is auditable and understandable. Um, so is it well organized? So you're using things like literate programming, um, which we'll talk about later. Um, and can you find, again, these corresponding parts of the output or the manuscript? Also checking if all of the parts of the process are available. So that um, it could be that you've gotten code that takes the raw data and turns it into the analyzed data, excludes some people, does some data processing, but nobody's giving you the raw data. All they've given you are the analyzed data and then further code. So it's difficult to tell um, where do you start, which bits are, um, like some of the scripts will run, some scripts won't run. So checking if everything is there that you need. Um, and the final thing that you can look at in, or like the, the thing that requires the most expertise and the most time is checking if the code follows best practices. So you can spend a kind of infinite amount of time on this. Um, so giving advice about general coding principles, things like, um, whether or not the variable names make sense. In a recent review I did, um, someone used sort of numerically incrementing um, data frame and analysis names for their objects. So they would have data one, data two, data three, analysis one, analysis two, analysis three. And then at some point in the script, they became unlinked. So like data four went with analysis five and six, and then data five went with analysis seven, eight, nine, and 10, and it became incredibly confusing. And I wasn't sure which of the data sets and um, other sub objects were meant to correspond with each other and what they corresponded to in the paper. Um, so giving advice about naming stuff. Um, also things like repeated code or values that are defined in multiple places. There's two principles, dry and spot, that we're gonna talk about after this. Um, also another best practice about long processes. So if you're lucky, if you're working with smallish data sets, your scripts will run in a minute or two. Um, I've had Bayesian mixed effects models that took 14 days to run. I wouldn't expect any code reviewer to do that for me. So um, you can tackle that sort of thing by saving the results of processes that take a long time or require a supercomputer to run, save that, set the code somehow to not run, however that happens in the language that you're working in, and then load the saved data with a note about, here's the code that created this, here's why we're not running it right now, allowing the reviewers to check over the code, 
sort of um, manually, but also skip the steps that take absolutely forever. And finally, are there sense checks or unit tests um, where appropriate to figure out um, are you actually doing the things that you're meaning to do in like your data cleaning um, and data reshaping? Oh, that wasn't the final one. OK, so our final final one um, is a check that might require domain expertise. So again, most appropriate if you are somebody with a, a similar level of or a higher level of coding experience than the person that you're checking. And also you might need to be in the same um, sort of disciplinary domain so that you can check to see if the code's actually doing what it was intended to do. Um, here the coder can help you out by explaining well what did they intend to do instead of um, making you infer what they intended to do by what code they wrote. Um, you can check to see if what they intended to do was correct, if there are actual logical errors. So this, these sorts of things can happen. You can try to um, filter a data set to only look at women, but actually you filtered women out instead of filtering them in um, and actually ended up with a different data set than what you had intended. Um, but other things you might need this domain expertise, like if, you know, if uh, a questionnaire has reverse coded items um, that somebody forgot to reverse code. Um, I'll be clear about what are not the goals of code check. So giving debugging help might be something that you need and you can ask um, colleagues to help with, but asking for a code check isn't debugging help. If you are doing a code check, you shouldn't be expected to help somebody fix errors in their code that they already know are there. Um, again, getting code help that they don't know how to do something or want help to um, make things more efficient. As a code reviewer, you might suggest ways to make the code better, but um, as a coder, you shouldn't ask somebody for code review with the um, intention of writing sloppy code because they'll just fix it for you. And additionally, statistical help. This is something that you can ask someone for, but it's not necessarily meant to be code review. So if someone says they've reviewed your code, it doesn't mean that they've checked your stats and made sure that they were the right stats to do for your study. Um, that's a, a separate area of expertise. <laughs> 